Good day, mate. 40 here. So I got up this morning just after 4 a.m. Had to be all limber and ready to watch uh, United States tackle Iran to get into the knockout stage in the World Cup, which started at 6 a.m. Sydney time. And uh, when I logged on, I saw, and I checked Twitter, I saw that uh, Colin Dell had said, sometimes I think Luke Ford is the last sane man on the internet. And then I remember he's an Aussie, an Aussie bro laughing as a Jew. I thought that's a nice thing to say. And then I thought, a lot of people are reasonably sane, perhaps in part because they have a large segment of their life that is non-rational, right? Man does not live on reason alone. So nationalism is largely a, a state of mind, it's not necessarily the most rational thing, but it's the it's a bond that you feel with members of your nation. And scholars of nationalism often say that nationalism can be best understood by looking at songs, looking at poetry, you know, looking at effusions of emotion you know, rather than rational theses. And so too, the best marriages I've noticed People tend to have highly irrational views of their spouse. Right? They believe that their, their wife of 50 years is the most beautiful woman in the world. And I've seen the scientific surveys that, you know, having a vast overestimation of the value and worth of your spouse is one of the predictors for a lasting marriage. Now think about the enormous you know, emotion that I get from being a supporter of the Dallas Cowboys, Los Angeles Dodgers, or you know, the American soccer team, or the Australian cricket team, right? That's, that's non-rational. There's no reason that I should give a toss about what these professional athletes do, but it, it moves me emotionally. When Tony Romo, uh, an undrafted free agent, became the starting quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, right, that was, that was moving to me. And that's non-rational, even irrational, that I should be so emotionally affected by Tony Romo. So I think for a lot of us, that we benefit from having a substantial portion of our life that is irrational. It's non-rational, so it makes life a little more magical and enchanted. Like when you see more to reality than is really there. Now, of course, this can get you into trouble. So I'm talking about using these things in an adaptive way. But you know, a lot of religious faith is non-rational, even irrational national feelings, sporting feelings, having a vast overestimation of the relative value or qualities of your spouse. Frequently non-rational, even irrational. So I think some of us like need room to play, even to laugh. and to indulge in the non-rational and the irrational. And, uh, and then that, that then you know, facilitates being rational in other areas of your life. So, for example, you may not want to study music critically, you may just want to enjoy music. So, some people, when they break down the notes, and they, study music critically, or they study poetry critically, or they study the Bible critically, it removes the enjoyment. And so many people 
find the Bible more enjoyable, more emotional experience, they believe that every word came from God. Many people get more enjoyment from music if they don't critically analyze it, or from movies, or from TV, or from novels. Like Sam Bankman Freed talked about how he never read books, that he thought anyone who had written a book was a loser, because he could probably have summed up the point of his book in a six paragraph blog post. But uh, the journey, the journey through a book is the, is the point, not necessarily the upshot, it's not necessarily the destination. It's the pleasure that you, you get along the journey. And we need pleasure in life, we need uh, joy in life. And that frequently comes from the non-rational and the irrational. And uh, for example, I'm not taking bus 374, which is the fastest way to get where I want to go. I like taking light rail, even though it's going to delay me 20, 30 minutes. I just like the slow, pleasant light rail journey, rocking me back and forth. I'm not in any rush. It's uh, 12.40 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon here in Sydney. And I'm just going to irrationally, non-rationally, and rationally make my way to Circular Quay next to the Sydney Opera House. And maybe I'll take a ferry to Parramatta. And I intend to enjoy the journey. It's not just about getting to Parramatta. In fact, there's nothing in Parramatta of which I'm aware of that I want to see. I just want to enjoy what I believe is the longest ferry ride in the uh, Sydney ferries. A nice, leisurely 30-minute jaunt up to the Parramatta River. So, just because someone may be laughing in one area of their life, and I don't accept that uh, I'm laughing as a Jew. Conversion to Orthodox Judaism is very demanding, and it remains an integral part of my life for way more than 20 years now. As my friends are Orthodox Jews, I spend uh, most of my social time with Orthodox Jews and Orthodox institutions, doing Orthodox rituals, uh, participating in Orthodox study of Torah, having meals with Orthodox Jews. Right, it's a high intensity, high demand religion. It's not something that you can just laugh at. All right? You spend so much time in synagogue, so much time around other Orthodox Jews, that if it was just a lot for you, people would just see through it in a second. But even if you do have things that you laugh at, doesn't mean that the rest of your life can't be serious and effective and rational and clear. There's a time for love and a time for hate. There's a time for reason and a time for non-reason. There's a time for lo love, joy, peace. There's a time for anxiety and fear and revenge. For everything there is a season and a purpose under heaven. So there are all these little places in Sydney where you're in the middle of the city and then suddenly you, you go down some stairs like over here and you just descend into some kind of lush tropical paradise. 